Hi guys, welcome to our KPC Youth Evening Service. This is part five of a five part series called Rediscovering Jesus. And if you haven't seen any of the others, uh, we'd encourage you to check them out on YouTube. Uh, Judah was here last week and uh, today he's joining us again because we are reflecting on this very special day. Today is Pentecost, which is the celebration of the birth day of the church. We've got a guest speaker, Matt Simpson is going to be telling us a bit more about the significance of Pentecost and there will also be an opportunity to respond today and uh, and so if you've been watching these services and you're thinking um, I would love to be able to, to commit my life to God uh, then there will be an opportunity to do that. Uh, there will be a quiz with prizes and uh, we will also have some worship. Uh, so let's hand over to the worship band now. Uh, the second song is a new one called Awakening, which we sang at the beginning of the month. Uh, but let's start with a song you should know. It's called Holy Spirit, You Are Welcome Here. Thanks for joining us and over to the worship band. Holy Spirit.
Thank you, Worship Band, and thank you again to Philip Organ for putting the collaboration together. Uh, today's quiz is different to previous weeks. You do need to email me your prediction of how many Jenga blocks it will take to demolish the giant Jenga tower. And you have to send that through before the tower is demolished. So now's your last chance to do it, but I'll hand over to the Holden family uh, to, uh, to show you the Jenga game. So email now if you want to take part. Welcome to the Holden Jenga Challenge. If you haven't emailed yet, you've still got a chance before this falls over to email me the number of blocks that it will take to make it fall down. We're going to go in age order, starting with Jacob. So over to Jacob. No. Not from the top. <laughs> And now we have the Bible reading from our Peaches, followed by a message from Matt Simpson. So over to Will and Emily. Hi there. We're reading from Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 24, and then on from verse 38 to 41. It is a long read, and uh, so I'm sorry to put you through this, but it is awesome. It's the coming of the Holy Spirit um, on the day of Pentecost. So here goes. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pythagoria and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Lib Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking them, said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Many of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood 
before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So we're going to jump on now to verse 38. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his words were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. I believe you young people call that a mic drop moment. See you. I wonder how often you think about your birthday. I'm not talking about the day that comes around every year, which you celebrate with a party. I'm talking about the actual day that you were born. Well, I'm guessing you probably don't think about it very much because of course you don't remember it. But even though you don't remember it, it's still very, very important, isn't it? After all, without that day, you wouldn't be alive now. And you wouldn't be able to celebrate your birthday every year. Maybe one day you might like to ask your parents what the first day of your life was actually like. Well, today we're celebrating a different birthday. Uh, in the church calendar, we call this day Pentecost. And actually, it's the birthday of the church. Without it, I wouldn't be here talking to you and you wouldn't be at home listening to me. So what happened on that first birthday of the church? Well, what we see is a group of people who were utterly transformed. There were people who'd been scattered and defeated. They'd been utterly crushed. But from that day on, they became a movement, a movement that would go on to change the whole world. A movement that today we call the church. Now, when I say the church, I don't want you to get me wrong. When I use that word, I'm not talking at all about a building and neither am I talking about an organisation. What I'm talking ab about is a movement, a movement of people in a common cause, a cause to follow King Jesus and do what he did and believe what he said. And as I say, this movement has gone on to become the biggest movement in human history. It's transformed literally billions of lives across history and across our world. And none of that could have happened without the day of Pentecost. So what happened on that day, the day that the church was born? Well, we see the account of that in uh, the book of Acts chapter two. It says, that when Jesus ascended into heaven, he left his disciples with instructions. And the first thing he wanted them to do was wait, wait for a gift that he had promised them. So the disciples did that. They were waiting, they were huddled together in this room with a locked door. And it said on the day of Pentecost, which was a festival that the Jewish people celebrated during that time, it said on that day, the Holy Spirit came down upon them. And when he did, the effects were physical, they were tangible, and they were very, very dramatic. The Bible says that the disciples heard something like a wind, and they saw what looked like tongues of flame laying above each of their heads. And suddenly they were able to speak uh, many different languages. Uh, you see, there were people there from different countries, and they were able to understand the disciples, even though these people had never learned their language. It said that then that Peter preached and he explained to the people what was happening. And it said on that day, 3000 people gave their lives to Christ. 
And then we see this group of, as I say, timid, frightened disciples, utterly transformed. They started to be able to live out what Jesus had commanded them. They were able to um, live radical lives. They were able to share everything together. They were able to meet daily for worship and they were able to talk to people about what Jesus had done for them. And from that moment on, the church grew and became this movement that we now know, uh, which uh, spreads throughout the whole world. What happened was at Pentecost, which, as I say, is like the birthday of the church, the spirit empowered these disciples to 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 follow Jesus, not just with their words, but with their lives. And that's why we're here today. And the reason I believe that what the Bible said about this day is true because is because for me, nothing else can explain the transformation that happened in those disciples' lives. Why this group of people who'd been getting everything wrong suddenly started to live this radical, amazing life uh, and to start this amazing movement which would spread all around the world. So just like your birthday makes a difference to you today, for Christians, the day of Pentecost also makes a difference in our lives today as well. Because the Bible says that the same Holy Spirit that empowered them also helps us to live for him today as well. Now, I wonder if how aware you are of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Today might be an opportunity for you to reconnect with this gift that, he, that God gives to every Christian. And we might be able to reconnect with that by just thinking about how the book of Acts describes the Holy Spirit and what he did in those disciples lives the first way he's described is uh, as being like uh, like a, a mighty wind now of course you can't see the wind can you but you can feel the effects of the wind you can see what it does and that's a bit like the, the holy spirit is for us today the holy spirit's a bit like a wind from heaven and he's a wind that shakes us up he's a wind that disturbs us He's a wind that lets us know that there's more to life and gets us ready to change. So that's the first way he's described as like a wind. The Holy Spirit is also described in this chapter as being like fire. And fire is so powerful, isn't it? Pa uh, fire brings light and warmth. And fire also cleanses and purifies. And I think what this image is telling us is that God will also bring his warmth and his light into our lives through the Holy Spirit. He'll set us on fire for him, uh, for him with his love. And in this chapter, we see the disciples being able to communicate, actually in this case, in miraculous ways. Even They're even able to communicate with people who speak languages that they've never learned. Now, this might not be exactly the same for us today. But actually, from the beginning, the church has been about building a new family, bringing people who aren't like each other together. It brings together people from different races, from different nationalities, and it forms them into this one new church. And that's why we are, as a church, able to worship together, even though the people we might be standing next to are very different to us. And I think also behind this is also the idea that the Holy Spirit enables us to communicate with others about Jesus and helps them to understand what we're saying. And I think that's also something the Holy Spirit wants to help us with today. Now, on our birthdays, we're given gifts, aren't we? And on that first day of Pentecost, the church was also given a gift. And it's a gift that we can also receive and enjoy today. So shall we today ask God to help us to unwrap that gift as we remember together the birthday of the church this year? So let's let's pray. Shall we pray? Lord, we want to thank you for the, the birthday of your church uh, that you invite us also to be a part of. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift that you gave those first disciples, but you're also giving to people today. Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is like a wind from heaven, shaking us and getting us ready for change in our lives. We thank you that the Holy Spirit's also like a flame, setting us on fire with love for you. 
And we thank you that the Holy Spirit gathers us as different people, old and young, rich and poor, from different nations and languages into one church together. And the Holy Spirit helps us to communicate to people who don't know you yet. So Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that you offer to each and every one of us. Help us to unwrap and receive that gift today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, Matt, for that excellent message uh, and for that reflection for us all on the significance that the Holy Spirit plays in our life. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Anna, who's going to share today's story, which is connected to uh, the move of the Holy Spirit that we have heard about today. So over to Anna for today's story reading, followed by Natasha, who will be sharing her perspective on keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Thank you, Anna and Natasha. Daniel O'Dowd was ever so loud by Julie Fulton, illustrated by Alina Ellis. Daniel O'Dowd was ever so loud. He shouted wherever he went. At the zoos, the chimps cried when his mouth opened wide and the elephant hid in a tent. When he shouted at school, his teacher, Miss Poole, wrapped a big woolly scarf round her head. She declared, I've no doubt if you stopped shouting out, you would hear something useful instead. The class went to visit Professor McQuizzit. He built things like airports for bees. Mad machines to cut hair, an invisible chair and a telescope made out of cheese. Daniel shouted, Yippee! Look, let me look! Let me see! All the noise made Miss Paul start to frown. Daniel's shouts grew so loud that they scared all the crowd and made the town's lighthouse fall down. Daniel screwed up his face and looked up into space. He saw satellites, planets and stars. Then he shouted in shock, I can see a huge rock and it's racing towards us from Mars. Professor McQuizzit said, hang on a minute, I've a rocket I made from a clock. If I send Daniel out and he gives a big shout, I think he could shatter the rock. Daniel clambered on board, the engines all roared and the rocket shot way, way up high. It zoomed past the moon and a spaceship and soon it was next to the rock in the sky. Daniel gave a loud shout, the noise echoed about but the rock simply shuddered and twitched. So he shouted lots more, more than ever before and bang! The rock burst into bits. The professor said, wow, you can stop shouting now. I'll explain how to fly back to Earth. But the boy didn't hear what was said in his ear. He was cheering for all he was worth. The rocket sped on and soon it had gone many miles from young Daniel's hometown. When he saw with a fright the Earth vanished from sight, Daniel cried out, I want to get down. He bellowed and yowled, he hollowed and howled, till his face went a bright rosy red. Then he thought of Miss Paul and her listening rule. I mustn't shout, I must listen instead. The professor cried, quick, pull the red control stick. Daniel pulled it as hard as he could. The rocket swung round and flew back down to the ground, landing right where the lighthouse had stood. Daniel O'Dowd was no longer so loud. His adventure had made it quite plain. I will listen lots more. I won't shout like before, unless the earth needs saving again. The end. Hi guys, Natasha here. By the time you listen to this, I would already have left KPC. Spirited away as mysteriously as I came. However, all is as it should be. We have come full circle. He brought me to you as an emergency measure, but now the emergency is no longer. Although we find ourselves in a new normal, which impacts every facet of the seven cultural spheres of influence, those being religion, family, business, media, the arts slash entertainment, government and education, God is in control. We can trust him to bring us through. 
God is also strategic. He has moved me on to my next adventure to play my part, having taken us through Passover, which I run a session on for our home group, as well as remembering Jesus' sacrifice with a reflection on prayer for Good Friday, to looking at who Jesus is with a four-minute power-packed spoken word piece by Clayton Jennings and celebrating the fact that he is risen with a beautiful inspirational piece by Motion Worship. He also led me to introduce the young people in the home group to the narrative of being chosen, unique and loved, so much more because of their quirkiness and diversity, just like Mary, Peter, Nicodemus, Andrew and Matthew. I hope that stays with them. As the show says, get used to different. That's a reference to Isaiah 43, 19. See, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? It is a now word for us, particularly in the times that we are living. Today we are looking at Pentecost, the time when the first apostles received the Holy Spirit. I started this May time series first by asking you to imagine what Mary Magdalene would say if she were experiencing social distancing in our present situation with the invisible enemy. We then looked at Peter's pioneering heart, he being reinstated by Christ. Then we revisited the rich young ruler, which references the book of Haggai and asks, whose house are you really building? Last Sunday you heard from a contemporary northern woman with the issue of blood, who was restored. And here we are, celebrating the coming of the Holy Spirit. What an unprecedented time to share this with you all, in a time where staying apart is the most loving thing we can do. I pray the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will blow afresh on us all today, whatever we are going through. Do remember to keep your eyes fixed. Take care. Much love. Natasha. I have resolved to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. But what does that look like to me? It looks like turning up on a Sunday morning to KPC, having no idea what I'm going to face, but trusting that everything will work out for me. It looks like me saying yes amid great uncertainty, even when I have loads of questions, see. It looks like hope like you are enough, even when I'm compelled to strive for perfection. I have resolved to keep my eyes fixed on what is unseen, fixed on eternity. But what does that really mean? What does that look like to me? It looks like peace when there's chaos all around me. Like choosing to keep it moving when the enemy wants me to turn back and I feel like there's no one here that's got my back. What does it mean to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus, looking at the unseen rather than the limitations of what we see? It looks like anything could happen. Anything could happen now. And suddenly I'm here, having had very little time to prepare. It looks like trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me, to give me wisdom and insight, whilst leading me into a place I've never been to and people I do not know who do not know me. It looks like trusting that I'd find the right words when it really counts, whilst being courageous enough to be vulnerable when I really have no clue. What does it mean to resolve to have my eyes fixed on him? It looks like risking everything to be viewed as foolish in the eyes of those who profess themselves wise. It means being sidelined, 
enduring their lies, being taunted by pointing fingers and ignorant whispers of how she could have had it all, but instead was throwing it all away. Yet I still chose to listen to his voice. It looks like my being willing, and often in long seasons of stripping, darkness, uncertainty, pain. Out there in the wilderness, sojourning harsh desert terrains, again. Searching for something greater than me. And maybe I've been willing to live with so much uncertainty because the only way to fulfil my destiny was to live authentically to how Christ made me, without the need for performance or jumping through hoops, having no choice but to trust and take big leaps of faith. Keeping my eyes fixed on the unseen continues to strip away all the extraneous stuff whilst he shows me. This is who you are. This is where I want you to be. Stay in the process and let me show you, shape you, mould you, love you into the kingdom-sized woman that you are, mighty woman, pioneer. Simply be. It looks like using what I have been given to help others grow, but no longer in my own strength. So I try praying without ceasing, whispering. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Natasha, for that excellent monologue. And, and just want to say thank you to Natasha for everything that she has shared at KPC. We're really excited that Natasha is able to go on to a new full-time role uh, next month. Uh, so we pray God's blessing on Natasha in her life after KPC. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, we're also going to hear now from Tom, who would like to share his perspective on life after KPC. Hello everyone. My name is Tom Parkin, I'm 19, and I'm going to be telling you a bit about what I did in my gap year. After completing my A-levels last summer, I decided that I wanted to take a gap year, and I was chosen by the charity Project Trust uh, to volunteer abroad. I was chosen to volunteer in the Solomon Islands, um, so I taught maths and science in a rural secondary school in the Solomon Islands. For those of you don't know, who don't know, the Solomon Islands are a small country in the South Pacific, just northeast of Australia, uh, and they're made up of over a thousand islands and there are six main islands. I taught on the main island called Garda Canal. This is the Solomon Islands flag just here. I was supposed to be there for one year, and in fact I should be there now. Um, however, the coronavirus epidemic meant that I had to return early, so I was there for just less than eight months. Firstly, I would like to say a huge thank you to everyone who donated to my fundraising effort and especially to those charities who very kindly uh, supported my year through grants and bursaries. To fundraise, I held bake sales, plant sales, a wine tasting evening and I did the Noel Fun Run and managed to raise just over the £6,200 mark. The people of the Solomon Islands were very religious and so we went to church a few times a week and some of the villagers would go to church a few times a day. The church that we went to um, was very small and maintained by the community that we lived in. Uh, we'd be sat on wooden benches or knelt on the concrete floor for the service. Uh, the services tend to be quite long um, and especially for Holy Communion. Um, all the services were read out of um, a Melanesian prayer book. In fact, I have one here. Um, and the hymns are in there as well. Um, and so unlike other services that I've been to here in England, you could pretty much learn it all word for word from the book. I taught in a school run by the Anglican Church of Melanesia. 
Um, and so we'd have a liturgy every Friday afternoon, we'd have prayers in the morning and a big grace before every meal. What I learned from the islanders was that because they trusted so much in God, um, be it with the weather, uh, in sickness or blessing their food, um, it made me stronger in my belief because I could see um, how much devotion they had to God um, because and they led such carefree lives because they trusted that God would be looking over them and caring for them. Unfortunately, due to coronavirus, we had to return back to the UK four months early. However, luckily there have been no reported cases in the Solomon Islands. Um, and this is very fortunate because as with other small developing countries, they neither have uh, the infrastructure or the healthcare system uh, to be able to cope with uh, masses of coronavirus victims. Thank you very much for watching. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me on the email in the link below. And now's the opportunity that hopefully some of you might have been waiting for, an opportunity uh, to be born again. Not born again in the sense of a baby like Judah here, but born again in recognising that God is your father and you are his child. So I'm going to lead a prayer now, which you can use either to commit your life to God for the first time, or you can use it to recommit your life to God and, uh, and use this prayer as a way of saying that you have rediscovered Jesus and you want to recommit your life to him now. So let us pray. Father God, thank you for your love. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you that you call us into relationship with you. We recognize that it's because of Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on the cross on Good Friday that we are able to call ourselves children of God. And I pray now for anyone who might be listening to this who may want to commit their life to you for the first time. Please meet with them wherever they're at and draw them into your loving arms and assure them of the fact that they are saved. Eternal life is theirs for the taking. Please forgive their sins and welcome them into your family today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer for the first time or said Amen at the end, then please get in touch with us, email or messages on Instagram or WhatsApp to let us know because we would love to support you in the first steps that you take as a Christian. I want to say thank you again for joining us for this youth evening service. This is the final part of Rediscovering Jesus. But next Sunday at 6.30, we will be rediscovering church. So please sign in at 6.30 next Sunday. Have a blessed week ahead. It's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from Judah. Thank you and God bless you.